Um, wonderful. I want to um, welcome everybody who's joining us this, uh, this morning, actually going into this afternoon, for um, our second webinar in the Open for Anti-Racism series. And I'm just thrilled to have some of the developers of the Math Equity Toolkit uh, with us, um, which was a project out of Education Trust West. And um, Education Trust West, and I, I, I'm, you know, I apologize. I, I go, I attend your webinars, Rachel. Um, I'm on your email list. And yet I'm not sure if I can describe exactly um, what Education Trust West is. It's an advocacy research group um, around equity in education, really at all sectors. But um, <laughs> did that capture it? Um, and just doing really exciting work. I, that was a great description, Una. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll and we'll share a link later um, for the um, for your site as well. And uh, I should say that Education Trust West is one of four centers, I believe, around the country, um, all focused on um, advocacy and equity in in education. All right, uh, Liz. Next slide, please. Um, okay, <laughs> no worries. Um, we, uh, I'm going to introduce our amazing speakers here in just one second. Um, and but we do want a little call out to um, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, who has been supporting this anti-racism project and is is really a leader in open education, equity, and anti-racism, um, not only in education um, but really um, society wide. Um, and our focus today is the Math Equity Toolkit, uh, which is a really exciting project um, around making equitable classrooms, uh, starting first with the teachers um, and their, their need to really reflect on who they are, what they bring to the classroom, what might be their uh, implicit biases and how to really work with their students that, um, who, who may be the same as them or not, but it's um, it really that process, that learning cycle, I think is what um, Danny and Rachel would call it. And that's what um, they're gonna tell us about today. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I want to start by introducing uh, Danny uh, Wadlington. Um, Danny brings more than 13 years of field experience, two Master's of Arts degree in education and educational leadership from some of the countries, and I must say from some of California's top universities. Um, she's a master math teacher, um, helping to close the gap in numeracy acquisition for many students of color. Um, and in fact, if, I'm, if it's okay I, for me to mention Danny, she is a local high school teacher uh, here in the Bay Area, as well as, um, uh, one of the leaders, I, I, perhaps the co-founders of Quetzal Education Consulting. Um, and she's also an experienced West African dance teacher. Uh, she uses the interconnectedness of rhythm, movement, and math in order to engage her students and help them own their math identities. So thank you, Danny. Would you like to say a few words before we jump in? Sure, I think you got, I think you got it. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. And um, next up is Rachel Ruffalo. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She is the Director of Educational Engagement or Educator Engagement, I should say, at Education Trust West, located um, in Oakland, California. And her uh, career in education spans more than 20 years, serving as a teacher, new school developer, school leader, consultant, researcher, and advocate. And um, throughout this, she's been committed to pursuing equity and social justice. Um, she was a first generation college student and experienced the transformative, transformative power of education within her own family. Um, as the director of edu educator engagement, um, she, with, she works with school districts through a multi-year process that involves mixed methods research study to identify opportunity gap gaps and systemic inequities. And the Math Equity Toolkit is an example of that. Um, Rachel holds a master's in educational um, policy organization and leadership studies from Stanford and a master's in education and teaching and curriculum from Harvard. So th thank you, Rachel. Would you like to say anything before we jump in? 
I think you got it. Thank you. Okay. I, you both have such impressive resumes. I'm sorry if I got tongue tied there. All right, next slide, please, Liz. So for those of you who might be uh, new to the Community College Consortium, uh, we have been around for over a decade now. Um, we were founded right here in Northern California, but we are a national organization. Uh, we work with faculty um, in supporting their professional development um, to find and adopt open educational resources and practices. Um, in order to help students be successful and to reduce equity gaps. And um, so this particular project is really an example of that. Um, next slide, please, Liz. All right, so uh, very quickly, and I'm sorry, my internet seems to have been a little, <laughs> A little slow there. So for those of you who haven't heard of the Open for Anti-Racism Project, I hope most of you have. I know that we have the, um, we have our faculty cohort, which is our, we hope our first faculty cohort going through this process. Um, and it's a one-year program to explore how faculty can use OER and open pedagogy to make their instructional materials and their teaching practices more anti-racist. Uh, our, our faculty cohort, um, there are 17 of them uh, from a regionally dispersed California community colleges. You can see that it covers a wide range of disciplines from administration of justice uh, through sociology, social work, chemistry, uh, math, et cetera. Um, so really spanning just a wide set of disciplines. And we're so interested to see how the open um, pedagogy and OER works within different disciplines. Um, and, you know, I know in talking with Rachel and Danny about, um, about math, um, we had a, a discussion around how, you know, sometimes when you come to teachers initially and say math may not be taught in an equitable manner, it may not be inclusive, and they're like, well, it's all about numbers. I mean, you know, what's, what, what does numbers have to do with equity? And um, so, so I think we will hear a lot more about why that's so important, uh, why teaching math is, is a key example of um, the need for um, equitable uh, thought. All right, next slide, please, Liz. Okay, so I'm going to just give a brief introduction and then we are going to go directly to our presenters here. So um, the Math Equity Toolkit, it's a toolkit of resources that were developed by really um, teachers, practitioners, um, coaches, professional development providers, and, and language development specialists, although we're not going to focus on that one particularly today, but I think that's a really fascinating piece as well. And it's all about supporting teachers in their journey towards anti-racist instruction and helping their students to be successful. And there were five strides, and I think Rachel will give us a little overview around that. Um, Today, we're focusing on dismantling racism in mathematics instruction, which is the first stride. And there's a lot of resources online to support your further investigation of this. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel and Danny. Thank you so much, Una, for the introduction and for the invitation to join you in your cohort and um, other guests today. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Um, so as, as Una mentioned, um, we typically share this with mathematics instructors, and we're just thrilled today to have an opportunity to talk more generally about the process of developing this tool to support you all in your anti-racist work in your own context, and uh, believe that, um, that much of the content is likely applicable to your context as well. I'm going to try to... I see a spinning circle on my screen, so I'm going to see if I can advance the slides. <laughs> there we go. 
Bit in advance. Okay, there we are. So you've already heard about us. So I'm going to click through this. Um, and as Una said, the Education Trust West is a nonprofit educational equity organization focused on educational justice and closing achievement and opportunity gaps through research data, policy analysis, and advocacy. And I would add to that also um, through practice. And so we do partner with uh, practitioners throughout the state, through early childhood, through college. Um, it's an important feedback loop to inform our policy and also to inform our research agenda. Oops, in my... Okay. I got a little, I got shut down here. Okay, so I'm apologize. Let me reopen the. <laughs> the slides. No worries. Technology is always. Uh, you weary. know, it, I had it all set up and now my computer is um, acting tired. <laughs> Let me see. I can also share. Let me. Um... Okay. Yeah, that would be great, Danny. Thanks, Danny. If I can get it back in time for your presentation, I can support you. Okay, let me. This is the moment when I always say, imagine what our students are going through, right? I, you know, it's a, it's a humbling and a good reminder. I think about that too, like how challenging it can be for adults. Um, all right. Okay. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, so I'm just going to share a really brief overview of the toolkit generally, and then Danny's going to dive into um, really the heart of Stride One, which I think is um, really aligned with the work of your cohort. So the uh, the toolkit is made up of these five different tools that we call them Strides, and they were collaboratively developed. Um, to support teachers in providing equitable access to grade level priority math standards. Our focal student groups um, are Black, Latinx, and multilingual students um, in grades six to eight, all, although we have found that the principles and the practices are really applicable beyond just grades six to eight and really beyond um, just math. Next slide, please. Um, so why is it needed? Um, well, we were approached because there, um, this was in late spring where we knew that teachers were going to need to make some strategic instructional decisions due to, to the pandemic and to the disruption to the school year. And um, as we started planning what this might look like to support teachers, we really couldn't ignore that the gaps in, in access to quality math instruction pre-existed the pandemic and the conditions have just been exacerbated throughout this crisis. And so we really seize this opportunity as not just to be like a, a COVID response type of resource, but really an opportunity to transform math education and to really help um, educators to think about what they can do in their own context to really be much more in tuned and responsive to the needs of students while being very cognizant of the systemic racism that exists and permeates all of our, our um, institutions and systems. So next slide, please. So we definitely could not have done this alone. We brought together a group of 35 amazing collaborators, including Danny, um, from all of these organizations, many county offices and universities here in California, as well as some national partners such as Unbound Ed and the English Learner Success Forum. Uh, we had teachers and coaches, researchers, professional development providers, really a, a wide range of perspectives and expertise. Next slide, please. Um, we also grounded our work. So we had to work fairly quickly and we brought together folks from all these different organizations. And so we wanted to ground our work in some guiding principles and foundational documents so that we could have coherence and some common themes and threads throughout all of the strides. And so um, not gonna go into detail, but just offering this as I think an important approach to um, a complex um, task like um, supporting equitable and anti-racist instructional practices. Um, so one of the, the, if you can go to the next slide, the first principle was that equitable access to high quality standards aligned curriculum and instruction should be universal. So we used um, the instructional priority content from student achievement partners to help us, um, to help guide our work in what, the what of uh, the teaching 
which what content. The next slide. The second slide is, or the second principle is that barriers to equitable access to high quality curriculum are the result of structural racist and biased systems, not students backgrounds, cultures or family income. So as we think about the approach to the barriers, the barrier is not the students, the barrier is the system. And so we really also relied on this um, position paper from Todos Mathematics for All that um, put some language to the moment that we are in and the opportunity to really rethink um, mathematics for this year and every year. And then the third principle um, is that beliefs and language about students and their families shape how um, adults view and teach students. And so we wanted to be very mindful of being assets oriented in our, um, in our language, in our approach and in our practices. And we um, relied and kind of based a lot of our work on the California English Learner Roadmap, especially principle number one, assets oriented and needs responsive schools. Next slide, please. Uh, so our group, when we first began to put together the toolkit, we focused on the question of what are the barriers to equity? What is, what is it that our toolkit is trying to support teachers to address? And um, we, we came up with many ideas, and I invite you to answer this question in your own context. What barriers to equitable instruction do your students experience? And I invite you to put in your response in the chat. Um, as you do, thank you, Danny. As you think about that, I'll share some of the ones that our team came up with on the next slide. Um, so we had many and we found that they spanned instructional barriers. Some were structural, some were systemic. And we wanted to focus on barriers that teachers are um, have some control it over in their context and those who are supporting teachers. And so you'll see we have these five that we focused on that created the basis for each stride in the toolkit. And the first one, this acculturation of bias and racism in school systems and mathematics instruction is the one that we'll be focusing on today with uh, stride one. The other four are really about um, teacher training and curricular supports and supports for teachers to shift instruction and to build their capacity to meet students' needs, both in language development and social, emotional, and academic development. And so those are all great strides as well, but we won't be focusing on them today. The net, um, so this is the stride that Danny will be going into more detail, um, dismantling racism in mathematics instruction, but just wanna share the titles of the other four strides with you so that you can, if they pique your interest or you know people who might benefit from um, looking at them, um, just want to make you aware of them. So stride two is fostering deep understanding it's uh, methods for deepening student conceptual understanding through orchestrated math discussions that build on and connect multiple strategies. Again, the content is math, but really the, the, the practice could span um, various content areas. Stride three is about environments that and practices that support students' social, emotional, and academic development. So this one is called Creating Conditions to Thrive. Stride four is the interconnectedness of English language learning and the development of mathematical thinking. This one is called Connecting Critical Intersections. So this is the one that really aligns English language development with uh, math content and math practices. And stride five is geared towards um, coaches and others who are supporting teachers in their growth, um, their professional growth. And it's called Sustaining Equitable Practice. And it shares some coaching structures that support math educators in their ongoing centering of equity principles. Again, it, this would be completely applicable to any teacher who is um, wanting to go through some reflective processes with a coach or a colleague. Um, and there's some great resources in that stride five. So I'm going to uh, share also the web page again, equitablemath.org, where you can download all of the strides um, or 
each individual individual stride or the whole toolkit. And that area that circled there on the next slide is a close up of it. It is a, um, it's okay. <laughs> it's a, um, there we go. It has the, um, we did webinars, we did deep dive webinars for each of the strides. And so you can access the recording from each of those webinars. They were presented by the content developers of each stride. So um, those are great resources and we encourage you to share them widely. And, and then I think the next slide is my transition to Danny, who will take you all in a deep stride, a deep dive into stride one. I apologize for going so quickly, but I wanted to make sure to uh, leave as much time um, for Danny to share. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. All right, so I am gonna do a deep dive into Strad One, but like Rachel said, um, the deep dive sessions that are on the website are really important, and I talk a lot more there about how to use the tool. So today I'm gonna talk more about the purpose um, of the tool and like what you might learn from using the tool. But if you wanna learn how to actually use the tool, you can, you can check out that deep dive um, as well. So when, we, so when we got invited to this project or when I got invited to this project and thinking about the barriers that students face, I really did think about teacher beliefs and teacher biases and how that impacts learning, especially in the math classroom, because we know that the outcomes for, for math students are very racialized. And a lot of the approaches to math have been like, how do we do math better? And I think that that's great, right? We also need to teach and engage with math in very different ways. But if we don't actually address racism, then we can't deal with the racialized outcomes. So much of math um, takes kind of a colorblind approach um, to the way that we have done math reform and and that then just leaves better math but not like the question is for whom right so yes we have access to a different kind of math different ways of learning math different ways of thinking about math but if they still don't encompass like this idea of racism then we haven't actually gotten to the root of the problem. We fixed maybe a symptom or how it might present itself. But as we know, there are still racialized outcomes. So we took a very racialized approach to how we, um, to how we wanted to, to, to go about addressing the barriers, um, barriers for Black, Latinx, and multilingual students. And what we did was we wanted to create a sort of action-based workbook to provide teachers um, reflection and opportunities to really examine their actions, beliefs, and values around teaching mathematics. And we chose a workbook approach because we know that some folks are not ready to do anti-racist work and you can't necessarily change their minds or their beliefs or their inherent biases in, in a lot of ways right at first. So we wanted to take an action-based approach because you can change folks actions and hopefully in the process we will change their hearts and minds. Um, so we really wanted to start off by thinking about how does racism show up in our math classrooms, right? Like how does it actually show up? And so we know that white supremacy culture is, is a part of our everyday lives. It's a part of the fabric of how we walk, um, how we walk the, the world, or not necessarily the world, well, we can argue the world, but at least here in California and in our country, we live in a racialized society. And so if we aren't very clear about thinking about how white supremacy culture like shows up, then we miss it, right? Because white supremacy culture is one of those things that, that just permeates. Um, and we don't even realize it's, it's invisibilized in a lot of ways. So we really wanted to, um, we really wanted to visibilize how it shows up. And we wanted to make clear that it shows up in, in everyday teacher actions. It's not like, oh, I'm like a lot of teachers decide, oh, I'm going to be racist today. That's not a thing, right? Like people don't always do that. Um, but we can still perpetuate white supremacy culture by, by engaging in what we might see as everyday typical math things. And for those of us who aren't also math teachers, like, I'm gonna give us an opportunity to think about like the ways that it shows up in math classrooms, but I'm sure you can read some of these and be like, oh, I actually do that in my class. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, on the next screen, here are, the, here are what we saw as 
the ways that white supremacy culture show up in math classrooms. And I want you to take a moment to read them. And if I can, I'm gonna put them in the chat box in case you can't read it on the screen. So let me take a minute to pause real quick. Um, I'll put them in the chat box so you can actually um, see them. Hold on, I have to stop sharing. It won't let me do that. Um, but what I want you to do is in the chat box, if you could, if you don't mind thinking about what are some of the ones that maybe you have engaged with? What are the ones that you've seen happen? Which ones strike your mind as maybe not something that you recognized before? Um, I invite you to um, read those right now and then put in the chat box which ones you which ones you're surprised about, which ones have you done, which ones have you seen? Oh, there's only one person. I know that most of us have seen or done or, or witnessed more than these. So thank you, thank you. Rigor is an interesting one. I'll, I'll try to maybe hit on that one a little bit, but feel free to add your own, feel free to, to share. Yeah, the right way and the only way, that happens a lot, especially in math. <laughs> yeah, the concept of rigor is really, it's really interesting. Tracking. So thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you all. Feel free to keep them coming. And so I think that like, right, like there are ones that are like kind of clear in our minds, right? That we might like, oh, okay, it makes sense that like when we're thinking about rigor, especially when we think of think, think about things like grit and like the, the racist um, undertones of what it means to have grit and rigor and things like that. Um, those ones are like maybe clear, but maybe it's not like addressing mistakes, right? That one may not be as clear. And so this workbook really offers you an opportunity to think about um, to think about more ways in which white supremacy culture shows up in our classrooms. But we can't also we can't only talk about white supremacy culture because I think that right like in in sort of visualizing what white supremacy culture looks like that's like oh okay now I know maybe what I shouldn't do but what should I do instead, and so. I want to make sure that as you engage with the workbook or as you engage with with thinking about this that we highlighted some characteristics of anti racist math educators. Um, because we need to know what we should do differently and so one of the one of the first one right is it's designing a culturally sustaining math space and even if you aren't in math designing a culturally sustaining space. And like an actual culturally sustaining space so not just like putting things up in your classroom or putting like posters of folks up in the classroom that has a place too. I'm not trying to knock anybody who does that I do that as well. Um, but really making sure that we design our spaces for students of color and for folks who may or may not be in our classrooms that still need to be centered, right? Like maybe you don't have a lot of um, black and brown students or maybe you don't have like LGBT students that you might see, right? But that doesn't mean that your space shouldn't welcome those folks. So even a lot of times with anti-racist work, they're like, oh, but I don't teach students of color. Well, I think that like you still should center them in your classrooms because we also don't want, um, we also don't want our white students, right? To walk out into the world and not understand experiences of folks of color too, right? So um, we have to make sure that our spaces are really culturally sustaining. So think about, um, for example, like I know that we like to think about routines, but for folks of color, ceremony is really important. So how we open our class, how we close our class is actually more than just, oh, we should do a routine because students should follow it. It's like, that's, that's actually part of like how we live life. And so thinking about how do you design spaces um, that are culturally sustaining for students. Um, Ethnomathematics is also really important. It's how we deal with numbers on a regular basis. There's no way that you have gotten up today and have, an and have not interacted with math or numbers. There's no way, you've done it already today. And so Ethnomathematics is really thinking about what are those everyday things that we sort of engage with that encompass numeracy or, or, math, or mathematics, even in ways we don't necessarily realize. And that goes beyond bringing like real world class like real world examples into the classroom because a lot of times what we do is we say okay we have this like thing to teach now let me figure out what in the world like does that 
And it's like, no, you walk the world and you engage in math every day. Why don't we bring that into our classroom and make sure our content aligns with that? And so really rethinking how we engage with mathematics and how we teach mathematics in the ways that we experience them as we walk the world, not just to bring in that real world content. Um, and that's true for folks who are not math educators as well. Like, I think we do the same thing like with ethnic studies, we treat ethnic studies like content and it can be, but ethnic studies is also a pedagogy and an approach. And if we shift that, then we can also think more widely and more broadly about how do we engage with, um, with ethnic studies um, for to close barriers for folks um, in, in a way that's different and doesn't seem like it's just based on content. There's so much work about ethnic studies as pedagogy and framework, and I encourage everybody to, to research that and look into it. Um, also, I know we've I know we've already had some comments about what, what rigor is and what rigor is not. And then another day we can go more in a deep dive of like what we mean to say make rigor accessible through strong and thoughtful scaffolding. And really that is important because I think a lot of times we sacrifice rigor to make things easier for folks just so that they get through it. And then a lot of times we actually over scaffold even when they could just be rigorous. And so really thinking about how we can redefine rigor and really think about rigor and scaffolding in a very, very different, in a very, very different way. Of course, we want to students of color to close the, the the gap in access to STEM fields. I'm not gonna talk more about that one, but that, that's also really important, especially in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley, we're right here. And like, we are leaving out, like our population, even in this space in Silicon Valley doesn't match, right, the employment. And so really thinking about that. Um, encouraging multiple and varying ways of sharing and communicating knowledge. This is so important, I can't, talk about how many classrooms I see students just get shut down for like doing things differently. We have different ways of being and all of that has to be incorporated into our classrooms. We can't, we can't not do that. Um, and it's more than just like allowing it. I think whenever you get to a point where you say you can allow something, we have to like check that a little bit because why is it what's allowed? Like we literally just exist. And so how can we make sure that our students are being able to exist in spaces um, the way that you know ex exist just exist as who they are in our spaces and communicate their knowledge um, and their ways of sharing it in that way because a lot of times what happens is if someone is not explaining it the way that we taught it or explaining it the way that we think is academic you know language then they're shut down in their thinking and that that that's not okay um, and this is a big one, supporting students to reclaim their mathematical ancestry. It bothers me when um, certain uh, mathematical concepts are um, connected with certain people when we know they existed beforehand. <laughs> um, and that's really important because like, we just know like, you know, anyways, I won't go into that, but I think that there's so much math that existed before it was recorded and worshiped in written word and that, that in itself, right, the written, what is written being valued is another form of white supremacy culture. So I just want us to like really challenge that. And one that's kind of missing from this list that I want to add is that we're always, that anti-racist educators are always learning and unlearning. Um, like earlier in the chat box, I saw that some people mentioned like very colonial ways of thinking and that, you know, we are a product in our history is of that. And so if we don't check, right, like our colonial ways of being and understanding the world, then we're perpetuating these ideas. So I would also add to consistently like learn and unlearn and keep in mind that anti-racism is a journey. It is not a destination. You can't check off any boxes. And so we are continually, right, as the world continually changes, we also need to adapt um, and adapt and, and alter these lists to, to include more of the experiences that we, that we have. And yes, sorry, I'm reading the comments, yes. Um, so right now, what I want us to do, I'm gonna invite us to freedom dream a little bit. Um, so freedom dreaming is sort of imagining worlds that are just representing people's full humanity, centering people left on the edges, thriving in solidarity with folks from different identities who have struggled together for justice and knowing that dreams are just around the corner, um, not these things far off in the distance. Um, and so what I want us to do 
is I'm gonna take us through an activity. So I invite you to turn off your camera if it is on, if you'd like, um, and to close your eyes if it feels right and safe to do so. And I'm gonna walk us through a freedom dreaming exercise. Okay, I'm gonna walk us through a freedom dreaming exercise. And um, I'm just gonna talk us through, I want you to literally not be limited, right? So I don't want you to think about what are these limitations? What are this? Just really imagine what it would be like if our schools were really anti-racist, if our students were thriving, okay? All right. So I want us to think about our classrooms, our schools, our learning spaces, and what they would seem, what they would look like, what they would feel like if we really engaged in anti-racist education. At the end, I'm gonna invite you to share, but I don't want you to focus on that part right now. I just wanted to give you a heads up. I'm going to talk us through this visualization. As we freedom dream, I want you to imagine what it would be like to do anti-racist work in your learning space. What would it look like to tap into holistic aspects of what it means to exist, to be, to learn, to teach? What would it look like, what would it feel like if black and brown voices, stories, and experiences were centered at your site? What would it feel like if the languages and native tongues of multilingual students were to be honored? What would it look like if Black, Indigenous, people of color were thriving? What would it feel like if white students, families, and teachers acknowledge their individual and collective privilege and work towards liberation for black and brown lives? What would it look like if white teachers, families, and the larger community and other folks with privilege and power gave all that up and other benefits in order to prioritize the needs of black and brown community members. What would it look like? What would it feel like if teachers modeled being anti-racist leaders in society? What would it look like what would it feel like if admin supported them in doing so? What would it feel like to build and sustain a culture of accountability, self-reflection, and growth? I'm going to give you a minute to silently reflect on any other questions or thoughts that came up for you.
That may have felt like a very long 45 seconds, but I wanna thank you for freedom dreaming with me. I'm gonna invite us to breathe deeply as we transition. I'm gonna count us in breathing in and breathing out. So let's breathe in. And out. And in. And out. One more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. And I invite you to open your eyes and turn on your cameras when you are ready. As you are turning your cameras back on, again, thank you so much for freedom dreaming with me. I invite you to share what were some things you envisioned when we did our freedom dreaming and what is your freedom or what is your freedom dream for your learning space. And you can either unmute or write in the chat box. I wanna give some time and space to, to do that. Thank you all for sharing. I see respect. All. Celebration, spirit. Differences. How awesome would it be to have vertical, um, not sorry, not vertical, but horizontal leadership. I love that idea. Thank you. Multiple languages, thank you. I'm gonna go back one slide because, you know, Dr. Bettina Love talks about how, yes, we freedom dream, right? But that freedom dream is not far off. It can be right around the corner and we have to work hard to make that happen. And that's a lot of why we are doing, right? What we are what we are doing. And so thank you all for sharing. Please keep them coming. One way that we, oh, I love these dreams. I'm really gonna read them as we go. So one way we thought about doing that, right, is to really get folks into the work. And so we created this workbook with this sort of five part plan of engaging, reflecting, planning, and then acting on that plan and then reflecting again to think about like, how was that work? How was engaging in anti-racist work for all of the purposes that you all are talking about in the, in the chat box? Like I really encourage you as you get into this, if you wanna work on this or as you bring this into your learning spaces, like keep in mind like you have a goal and you have a vision and use the visions that you're talking about in the chat box to make your action plans, to make those things happen because our dreams can be reality. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about, I know I said before, we have a deep dive of like how to actually engage with the work, um, but I know that not everyone here is a math teacher. And I also know that some questions around how the workbook um, can be used are really important. And so again, if you want to look at just how to use it, you can go to that deep dive that's on the, that's on the website um, on equitablemath.org. But also I wanna give you some, some considerations um, and other notes for how you might use this both in the, class, in the math classroom, but also in, in classroom spaces or learning spaces, or even in your life <laughs> if you'd like as well. Um, so the first thing is to read Tama Okun and Kenneth, jo and Kenneth Jones' Characteristics of White Supremacy Culture. A lot of the work that we do in the workbook is based on this. And this is really important, especially if you're not in a math classroom, because it shows how it shows up in organizations. And we are all part of institutions. Um, we are all part of an institution, right? Like even, even this organization is part of 
larger institutions. And so you can, this visibilizes how white supremacy culture shows up in the in our spaces and in organizations. And so you can be more cognizant of those things and can challenge them as they come. This article even has antidotes. So they treat it like this is a problem and how do we treat it with antidotes? Um, and so it's a really good article that is a really foundational one for anti-racist work. And it was really foundational to, um, it was really foundational to the work that we did with the tool, with stride one of the toolkit because we, we use those definitions and that language. And so a lot of times people are like, I don't understand power hoarding or I don't understand what it means when it says um, objectivity or things like that. And so this article um, from Tamo Okun and Kenneth Jones can really help to ground the definitions of those words. Thank you for putting the link in, Kim. Thank you, thank you. Um, also, you can go beyond this workbook. So like I said, for math books, right, like you can use it as is, other folks can also use it as is. But if you're not in the math classroom, think about the white supremacy culture characteristics, think about how they show up every day, like you can still read um, how and why they show up and what's the importance of, of dismantling them. And you can also take into mind all of the other information as well. But when you create your plan, sorry, I'm, I'm really bright right now. <laughs> when you create your plan, you can, um, you can do it for your own context, okay? So the workbook too was also written for, was also written like to, uh, for, to address two of the white supremacy culture characteristics per month. Um, but it's okay to maybe do one, right? Or it's okay to say, well, actually, you know what? I need a longer month on that. Or sometimes your school or your, your institution might be might have goals for the year that, that don't necessarily align, up, line, align to the way that we presented them in the workbook. So it's okay to speed up, slow down, do them in a different order. Um, think, about, think about how what's best for your content. Um, even though like, as you can see on the picture, right, there's the section for engaging and then they also offer what you can do instead. Please try out those verbal examples. So we, we thought about like, how do we change our language to um, support anti-racist efforts in math? So really try out the verbal examples. Um, try out the classroom activities. If you um, are wondering like, cause the classroom activities are little snippets. And so if you're like, I think I wanna try that. And some of the classroom activities are not don't also have to go with math, right? Like you can try this in your, in your classroom, not just in math. But if you need help with some of the classroom activities, feel free to email me. I would be happy to connect with you, especially if it's like activities or materials I already have put together, like just let me know. We can explain a little bit more or tell you how we use them in our classrooms because a lot of the class activities are things that we actually used um, and have done in the, in the past and are doing now. So um, please, feel free to reach out to me or the other content developers um, and for the classroom activities. Also, please implement um, the professional development. There's lots of ideas for professional development as an individual, as a department, um, as a school. There's a lot that we can work on um, there. And so they we also offer that professional development. Um, we offer professional development ideas in the workbook. You can also hire Quetzal Education Consulting. We are doing some, um, we do, we do anti-racist work in general. And in terms of like um, professional development, we have many opportunities for professional development, some that are specific to this workbook, but also to larger anti-racist ideas as well. Um, but most importantly, because I know that sometimes people get so caught up in the work um, that we don't always come back to the anti-racist um, characteristics or characteristics of anti-racist math educators. And so this visual is like just for you to visualize, right? Um, you don't have to read it right now, but I know that I did like a big picture of the anti-racist math educators, but in the workbook, there are also bullet points to unpack um, each of those characteristics and, and suggestions for how to teach. And like I said, you can do this whether you're in a math classroom or not. Sometimes it's just about changing the context, but the purpose behind the work transcends grade level and transcends content. All right, so thank you so much for listening to us and sharing space with us today. 
Um, I have really appreciated um, this and I want to open the floor for questions and comments. You all don't have to be shy. You can unmute or you can <laughs> chat, but. Well, I just want to know whenever Danny is facilitating a webinar, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel refreshed and inspired. Thank you, Danny and Rachel. Thank you. So I can say that um, it is it is very challenging when you're trying to find examples in STEM that are diverse in terms of who's being depicted um, utilizing something that shows physics. And um, I spend a lot of hours trying to add variety of color um, to my PowerPoint slides because um, I always talk about the wondrous variety of people I get to meet every semester. And so I try very hard to embrace that um, in what I'm presenting, but wow, in STEM, it is really challenging to find images with diversity. Uh, thank you for that, Teresa. We, um, we have a, a wonderful set of um, <laughs> links um, on our website and I will put that in um, the chat window. It's, it's a good start um, and um, yeah, uh, includes, um, well, James just presented on this this morning, it includes nappy.com um, and I'm, I'm gonna guess that um, Danny and, and Rachel have other suggestions, but um, I will look that one up and put it in there and I think that will that will, might be a start. Um, we have some through our, you know, I'm part of equity minded practitioners at our, our college as well. And we have some that we've come across, but I'm always looking for more tools because it is a challenge. Absolutely. Well, um, we will, um, I think we'll, we'll move on now to uh, just because we're coming up on the hour, but um, Danny and Rachel are still here and, and we'll come right back around to them at the end as you think of more questions for them. Um, and I did see a few, a few, a few more questions. Um, let's just finish out if we can. Uh, and James is James, uh, the co-lead of OFAR along with myself and Liz at CCCOER is gonna finish us out here. Great, thanks and boy, thank you, Rachel and Danny. Again, sign me up, Danny. Let me know whenever you're facilitating a webinar. Um, so we've got more goodness to come. If you missed our uh, webinar last month, it is uh, archived on the CCC OER website. That was also a terrific webinar uh, looking at uh, uh, a, a, a colleague in political science analyzing her discipline and the represent lack of representation in her discipline, and then a colleague uh, talking about anti-racist pedagogical practices and discussion practices in the classroom. Uh, in March, we've got a webinar coming up that features two colleagues, one from the African-American Male Education uh, and Network Development, AMEND, uh, talking about, uh, it's, it's a group of African-American males in community college leadership positions who mentor and support African-American students in community colleges. Then we have a colleague who's been active in open education, who is part of a group called Whites for Racial Equity. Uh, and the group is exactly what the name describes uh, white people talking the talk and walking the walk uh, for racial equity. So I think that'll be a really interesting perspective. Uh, in April, In April, then, we have uh, Community College Equity Assessment Lab, uh, Dr. Frank Harris. Many of you are familiar with, of the, with the work by Luke Wood and Frank Harris. Dr. Harris has agreed to speak with us in April, which will just be fantastic. If you've ever heard him, you know how great he is. Um, May is to, to be determined. And then June will be an opportunity for the participants in our OFAR, OFAR cohort uh, to share out some of the great work that they're doing and some of the ideas and discoveries uh, that, they're, that they're creating. So look forward to those webinars. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide is a little bit more information about the March webinar. Again, a AMEN, the organization AMEN. Uh, you can see the description there on the screen and whites for racial equity. 
uh, this, the description is on the screen as well. So again, I think that'll be a really interesting, uh, a real interesting webinar to see a couple of different approaches of doing the work that we're talking about uh, to provide supports a, a bit outside the classroom. And back to you, Una. All right, next slide, please. Thank you, Liz. I just wanted to mention to all you open educators out there that Open Education Week is uh, week after next, March 1st through 5th. Um, please uh, submit um, your wonderful projects uh, there and, and come and browse um, projects from around the world. So this is really, a, uh, it's an annual celebration. I think we're in our eighth year since 2013. Um, and um, it's, it, it, People submit really, uh, literally, from um, you know, forty countries around the world in multiple languages, um, and uh, I'd love to see yours there as well. And there's some links here on how you can get involved in other ways. Um, CCCOER will be do doing a number of um, events as well that week, and um, if you're on our email list, um, you will hear about them. Um, and um, we'll post a, a link there to our email list in just a moment. And these are just resources for you that we repeat once again, um, our CCC OER, the Community College Consortium for OER, uh, is website there. And um, we also point you to the wonderful resources being put together by, I, by our statewide academic senate uh, through their OER I project. And here is the email list if you would like to join that email list and hear about uh, various events during Open Ed Week and, and beyond. And I think we're we're just finishing out now. We um, do have a um, we do have a survey that we ask you to take. Uh, it's a very short three question survey. Um, and um, I don't know, Liz, is that easy for you to put in the um, chat window? Um, and we just want to hear how how the webinar went. And if you've got um, Thank you very much, Liz. And um, if you've got ideas for future webinars, we are, we're always interested in hearing what the community um, needs, needs to be successful in their open anti-racist work. So thank you so much, Danny and Rachel. And um, I, we will be here for a few more moments. So please, if you have additional comments, questions, please jump in. Um, you can unmic um, or uh, type in the chat. And Danny's been in the chat. Thank you, Danny, for addressing some of the comments and, and Rachel for adding the, the additional resources. I would encourage everyone to check out the Ed Trust West website. They do a lot of great work, a lot of uh, data analysis as well. Uh, so if you're trying to understand uh, what our students are going through, they've done surveys on, on what our students are facing during the pandemic, uh, just all kinds of goodness on the Ed Trust West website. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Rachel, the link. And yes, uh, amazing uh, webinars, uh, sometimes featuring uh, California community college leaders as well. So it's um, really wonderful. Thank you all so much for the opportunity to share with you and just be in conversation with you today. It was a pleasure. <laughs>